How many of you here have heard that saying, ew, that's so last year? Well, it's no secret that consumer preferences are constantly changing in this industry, and that's what makes it so hard, and it's been a perpetual challenge for brands and retailers to accurately forecast what consumers are going to want six to 12 months in advance because that's their product lead time. So how does one draw patterns from the appropriate signals? And um, you know, it's really hard. So what here, I'm here to tell you about the characteristics of unstructured fashion data that makes identifying and synthesizing fashion trends challenging, but how also understanding it can be a tremendously competitive advantage. So geek chic is kind of in my core DNA. I was a, an aspiring fashion designer growing up, um, but I started my career in technology investment banking and have spent my career operating and investing in retail companies. My co-founders and I started Trendalytics to basically understand the psychology about how consumers, um, how can we anticipate consumer demand for product trends and help retailers improve profitability. Today, I just want to give you a different lens into the world of fashion and retail. So why does it matter? Well, the state of the industry is quite dire. In the $350 billion apparel and accessories market, over 50% of merchandise is sold at a discount. And the challenge is, you know, how do you understand consumers when their preferences are constantly changing over time and the data is really unstructured and it's really hard to access? So let's take a look at a data stream um, within fashion. So what we do is we aggregate, we're basically monitoring the ecosystem, the conversation around brands, retailers, tastemakers, publishers, and we're organizing all of this information by different product attributes and styles. The questions we're trying to answer are around, where do I invest my dollars as a retailer? What products do I feature? Where do I target this regionally? And what is the timing? When do you double down on certain product categories and when do you get out? So how is the data at the core different in fashion than, let's say, understanding GE's financial performance or something? Well, we're here to delve into the key characteristics around influencer sentiment analysis, regionality, and seasonality, and um, how you kind of might want to look at it from a different angle. So in fashion, the dirty secret is that fashion trends are actually they actually follow quite a um, predictable pattern. And the trends often trickle down um, from the top. So just to give you an example of how the, the system works, you know, last month in September, we had all the runway shows in, you know, like in New York, Paris, Milan. And um, in this conference um, center is one of the biggest trade shows in the year where buyers and brands all come together. Everyone is making decisions on what to produce, what to market for next spring. Everything's happening in advance, but now we have a tremendous conversation thousands, hundreds and thousands and millions of users that are engaging with this data. So what we do is kind of look at this pattern over time and isolate how product trends are starting among industry influencers and how it trickles to the mainstream. This is kind of the core of the foundation of all the analysis that we do. So what's interesting is, you know, there, we all know about the limitations of sentiment analysis. But if we were just to look at the positive and sentiment analysis of, let's say, Birkenstocks earlier this year, we would have totally been wrong in predicting this trend. This is one where, you know, and what's interesting about fashion and that makes it actually quite difficult in terms of understanding signals is that it is an acquired taste. And actually preferences, a single person's preference for a product trend can actually evolve within a season. So let me give you an example. When gladiator sandals first came out, everyone thought they were hideous. And, um, you know, over time it's been adopted and it's been a, a summer staple silhouette or style for the last five years. You know, earlier this summer, Birkenstocks actually totally took off. It started in 2012, but it's something that the industry started to embrace. And um, it's been one of the top sellers in um, the fashion, you know, for a lot of retailers, including Amazon, um, this summer and selling out everywhere. So basically, for a nascent trend, we're not just looking at the positive and negative sentiments, we're looking for this shift in inflection points. At the core of the data, what's challenging is also how do we count the data when 
everyone calls something very, you know, we all like describe images in very different way and there's not a structured dialect in fashion. And so here we're looking at denim called boyfriend jeans. First of all, I don't know who coined the term boyfriend jeans, but it is the top number one search term. And so at Trendalytics, what we do is we basically are understanding similar images and the, context, like the metadata and um, disparate data around that and are mapping different, like basically similar product attributes. Um, so the reason this is important is to one, make sure you have a strong sampling of the data, um, even if it's described in very different ways. Um, and also there's a number of like really interesting business applications that even our current clients are using to drive business around you know, the types of terms you use for marketing effectiveness around SEM and SEO. So as far as seasonality, the industry itself is very seasonal um, because you have to really think about when you place products in your stores and the life cycle of that, that selling season. Um, the issue with seasonality, as many of you know, with any time series analysis, is that there's, there's a lot of randomness associated with time series. And so what we do is we use seasonal trend um, decomposition using lows to really um, isolate, to decompose the time series into um, three components, the data, the trend, and the residuals, so that you can really isolate the trend and um, be able to forecast. So what I'm showing you here is actually um, search patterns for Birkenstocks over the last 10 years. Using STL, you can actually isolate the green trend line that shows that it's been declining over the last several years, but there's been this uptick since 2012, and it's actually increased you know, quite a bit. And ironically, if you go back to the social media data, that's when the conversation within the industry was starting. So another thing to think about lastly here is um, regionality. As a business, we think about it because we have to think, where do I allocate my inventory dollars, target my marketing spend? And so it's interesting to look at where today, you know, there's um, kind of a propensity of, of demand. But what we really want to do is look at where patterns are happening. Where, where, when does a trend hit the primary markets and when does it move to the secondary markets and actually have a greater commercial viability? Um, so here's an example of how we're actually looking for thousands of trends over like um, several years. We're actually looking at seasonal patterns and how trends shift over time. Here we're looking at skinny jeans. I use this example because there's a lot more history on this. And so you can see in 2005 and 6, it started in New York and LA, which you know you, you would. It's, it kind of seems to make sense, but it took two years before it really took off in a big way in, other st in, in the secondary states, and a few years later before um, it kind of became a mainstream trend. So in conclusion, you can't really look at one thing in isolation because there's so many different factors. We have to really tie all the pieces together by looking at the conversation among influencers, the inflection points in sentiment, understanding dialect, seasonality, and regionality. But it's not only within one product category. Now exponentially look at this across all the different styles of sandals, let's say, and across categories. And so this is, um, you know, it's basically understanding those patterns and how the com um, all the conversations are shifting. So, you know, I think a lot of people in the retail industry are inundated with data. The last thing they need is another data set, but um, what we need to do is make it actionable and relevant for them. And because we're focused on the retail sector, we know what their questions are, we know um, what their daily workflows are. So we kind of take it to that next step. First, we filter out and surface the data that's most relevant to the fashion industry. And then secondly, we're focusing on the insights on that actually answer these key questions on what do I spend my money on? Where do I feature? Where do I target my dollars? And what is the timing of this? And all of these help support actions around what to buy, whether to reorder or liquidate merchandise. So lastly, I want to leave you with the why. Why are consumer preferences changing, and why is it made so difficult? Well, in this industry, creativity and newness is what's driving the industry, and we really need to keep that in mind from a data perspective. Um, for us, we're probably one of the very few data companies that actually really has a mission around fostering creativity, because um, we think in this business, that's what it really takes to win. So our mission is really around how do we understand areas where we can mitigate business risk so that companies have more leeway to take creative risks in the marketplace. Um, 
So thanks for listening. I'd love to share more if you'd like to learn.